Welcome to It's Not Just Business Talks with Sonia, where we get down to the real business of how great leaders dug through their own trenches and climbed some epic mountains to get where they are today. Now let's get started with the show. Welcome, Dean. Dean Newland is the founder and CEO of Mission Facilitators International, a boutique training and development firm based out of Phoenix, Arizona. Although I know you're not there right now. With the sole purpose of helping organizations become more connected to their purpose and their people. So far, so good. Founded in 1992, MFI is home to more than a dozen professional coaches, trainers, and strategic planning facilitators. Unlike most other firms where consultants work with their clients, MFI members work as a team in facilitating growth for leaders and organizations. Holy moly. Good job, Dean. Hey, that and, sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's the end of the show. We got it. <laughs> we got it. Wow. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about this, Dean, and uh, you know, what kinds of companies or people do you work with? What does oh, this boy. entail that I just pronounced yeah. the introduction? Well, in the 20 some odd years we've been around, we've been quite fortunate to work with a whole cacophony of different size organizations, some of them very large like ExxonMobil, some of them international like uh, Marriott, some of them very small like Powers of Automation that you sure. know very well in Bend, mm -hmm. Oregon. And you know, so you would say, well, we're not really focused on any particular industry, but we do seem to have a sweet spot for uh, healthcare. And oh, yeah. uh, those organizations that have deep dive, stupid, smart people who sometimes are so smart in their, their science and their skill that they may not always be so good about leading teams and being able to be strategic thinkers and um, motivators of uh, their vision. So we seem to do really well in that space as well to help, tr help those really intelligent people get better at coordinating and leading mm -hmm. and coaching and, um, and setting vision for their teams and their companies. How did you, um, Dean, if you don't mind me asking, how did you get so good at doing that? That How did this all start? I mean, where you wake up one morning and go, you know what, I'm going to work with ExxonMobil. That's not how it began. No, I mean, it's been constant working of relationships uh, just all the time. But if, you, if the question is, how do we get the, to those companies? That's one thing. How did I get started in the how business? How did you get started? Yeah. I'm curious about um, your 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 this how this matured from a uh, young dean to today working with high level clients like that um well young dean was an actor um and thought that's what he was going to do when he grew up um and he was okay at it but i think young dean soon realized that he was probably a better teacher mm -hmm. than he was you know um a sword clad carrying romeo so after a while, I, <laughs> I don't I know. Started, I, I beg to question that one. A little bit. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it, it just became pretty clear. Also, I was tired of living on futons and eating top ramen. And it was somewhat of out of necessity that I needed to do something else. But I was also fortunate at a particular time in my life when I got introduced to this whole thing called coaching, which back in those days in 92 or so was still a phrase uh, relegated and, and used to describe sports. And so after going through a fairly exhaustive um, training program where you had to be certified in front mm -hmm. of your peers, I went, okay, I think that's what I want to do. So it was a particular time in my life when I was going through a big personal change, getting out of a, a marriage, and I could all of a sudden move wherever I wanted to move. So I moved back to Seattle, Washington, and started up this little firm thinking, hey, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to wait tables. And sure. <laughs> um, you know, 29 years later, I'm not waiting tables, so it's still going okay. It's but it just kept kept yeah. building and building, you know. And we we found our way into really big companies. Now, this is a short story, but yeah, um, Joanne and I, my wife and I, were trying to get into these organizations like Microsoft and Hewlett Packard and Boeing and so forth. We'd never get past the the, the secretary, and we sort of lucked upon, it was really Joanne's um, relationship with somebody over at the Museum of Flight in Seattle who had this million dollar high-tech simulator of mission control in a spacecraft that was there to teach kids about science and technology to help them become more interested in that area out of the era when we had the Challenger explosion and a teacher yeah. went up and didn't come down. So sure. they didn't have anybody to do corporate events because a lot of these people were sending their kids but they were going, this would be fun. We should do that. So long story short, we developed some programs and, 
And we got very fortunate to um, have the Museum of Fight sponsor a bunch of events. And boom, all of a sudden we got all sorts of press around TV and radio. And wow, you know, nice. we got we got a lot of good, uh, huge shot in the arm. And that got us into the warehouses and all that. And once we got embedded there, then we just kept developing more programs. We expanded that program, the Challenger Center program, eventually tapered off. And now mm-hmm. we had just this juicy, wonderful, rich, um, enviable client list that we've mm, been able young. to stay connected to. I know it sounds like Christmas, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So anyway, that's just a very brief thing. But relationships is always the, the key thing. You got to do good work. You got to be fast. You got to be... Um, as much a coach, but also a consultant, you can't hide uh, back on what you, your point of view is. You have to have a point of view. You have to tell people the truth. Um, but if you know, if you keep doing that, your name gets around and all of a sudden you're, you're still here after a while. Your reputation is great. And I know that because, um, and also I happen to know since knowing you for a few years, um, they keep coming back. Exactly right. The, 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 yeah. you have super served a great many clients that I already know about, but I mean, is it really still great out there? I think you had mentioned something before we kind of got on the show here that you've started seeing a shift and I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, thanks for the tea up there. Um, so the the shift that I was just made more aware of recently on one of our team calls is something that's called the great resignation. Mm. And it's unprecedented in our lifetime. I mean, there's always been down economies and so forth. And there's always been a time when, say back in 09, the power shift went from the employer back to the employee. And all of a sudden we could say, all right, now we're going to, you know, employees now have a chance to go wherever they want to go. Once the economy came back, Uh, this is different. Um, You know, according to Gallup and other organizations that are doing studies on this, there's somewhere around give or take about half of all employees right now are actively looking for other work. No kidding. Yeah, it's not it's not 20 percent. It's half. You know, it's it's not just like I'm thinking about it, but no, I'm actively looking for something else. And that's not. And so any manager out there that's listening to this, whether it's a small company or large company, needs to realize there is a pretty good chance that a fairly sizable number of people in your own team very well could be looking for something else. Um, And that's a scary thought, but it's also a very interesting way to re-emphasize the (laughs) the basics around retaining and keeping people. And so I knew that we would have this podcast, so I kind of came up with eight little things. I want to hear them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still. I'll just try to be brief on this, but I'm still gasping uh, about the fact that half my staff could be looking, but I really don't (laughs) believe that. I I can't believe that for my team. But, it, but if they take it as a whole, you think of the number of people, some organizations are going to be 80%, some is going to be 20%, but you have to t- sort of take into the uh, of the idea that even if you have a strong team, how can we make it better? Mm-hmm. Because even with a company as strong as yours, um, you're always going to want to make sure that you don't get too complacent. You always sure. want to double down on how do we make um, our company sticky, you know, yeah, so that people absolutely. want to stay. Yeah. So I think number one is know your competitors, meaning like your pay benefits and culture. What's going on out there? It's almost like when you go to Zillow, we can get an automatic read on what your house is worth relative Mm -hmm. to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. In a sort of a metaphoric way, we need to get really much more accurate and timely data around what other companies like us are paying and giving their employees with benefits and what's their culture like. So we can then speak to that in interviews. Uh, two, I think we have to have a much faster onboarding. We have to get people in and we can't wait for a long series of committees to make decisions around who we should hire. We mm-hmm. need to get those things down and dirty and done. You know, let's not wait. Let's get those people in. And once they're in, we have to make some really good impressions as fast as possible because it's like you walk into a restaurant and if you don't like the look and feel of the restaurant, you're going to turn around. Sure. Yeah. And a lot of people are taking offers and signing on the dotted line, and then leaving very quickly. And so that period of the first few weeks is really important. Two, I think what, that we need, three, we need to be doing a lot more training and, and career pathing with people, such that um, you're going to be hiring people who maybe two years ago you have never hired because they weren't ready. Mm-hmm. Now you have to take them because there's nobody else. Sure. And the people that are currently working in your company are so strained and stressed and burned out that you're now afraid of losing them. So I think that training and career pathing is really important. Um, I think uh, number four, I would say really call out successes in people, making sure you connect them to progress as fast as possible. 
and also make failure an okay thing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what what are the lessons learned that we could um, come up with as a result of failure? Flexible scheduling, number five, if you mandate everybody has to be working from home or everybody has to be working at work, the stats seem to say that your engagement level goes down. But if you give people some flexibility, it goes back up again. So flexible scheduling is really important. I think that the CEO, number six, has to be much more out there and branded because people want to join companies because of the brand of the CEO, not just the brand of the company. And then uh, let's see here. There was something else about, oh, retention. Oh, I think you need to be doing a lot more. Number seven would be a lot more surveys around retention. Like how are people doing with engagement? What is the, what is the mood like? What's the tone like? Uh, so probably more frequent engagement surveys. And uh, last, when you do lose somebody, make sure you have an exit interview and you capture why did they leave. Mm, and usually you yeah. have to have an external person to do that, not your own company, because they don't want to tell yeah. you the truth, but they will tell sure. this other organization. So anyway, I guess that's just Fantastic. a quick rundown. Uh, thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Of course I do. Because yeah. uh, one, one thing I was wondering is um, you mentioned about the CEO being sort of the leader as uh, needs to be a little bit more branded. And I know that you went through this yourself not long ago. Um, um, you're you're both the brand and also the leader of the company, but your company had done some rebranding. My question is, what size organization does this apply to? Because um, you know, mm. you know, if it's a, if it's a small organization like uh, a Ma Pa store, that doesn't really relate. But you're talking about larger organizations, typically. How does that fit for you? Yeah, I don't know what that I don't know what the cutoff is, Sonia, on that. I don't I don't have a feel for that. I think that. Some of it has to do with the cycle of the company's growth. If it's a brand new upstart, the CEO uh, is going to need to be a tremendous visionary and a storyteller. Mm-hmm. And so the brand is going to be have to be around that. You know, if you are a more established company and you've been, you're past those growing pains and you've made some successes now, now it's about maintaining uh, what you've been able to build. And I think there's a different brand around that. But I don't know. Um, at what point do you need to start branding the CEO? I don't know. I just think that in some ways, this is just me. You're the expert more yeah, than I am in this, but I think that everybody's a billboard for themselves and for the company. And we need to right. make, take that seriously. Uh, even going to, to a Starbucks or whatever, you realize you're going to bump into somebody. That, yes, I, I bumped exactly. into somebody a couple of nights ago at a concert, you know, um, you know, you're just there. You always will find people who, who know you. And I think you have to be cognizant of that. Sure. And were you in your rainbow pants? I mean, did you get caught busted dancing or were you okay? <laughs> no, I was dancing. And luckily it was a, it was a friend that uh, was also dancing. So we had a good time. But, <laughs> Excellent. But, but to that point though, you do need to, I think, you know, I'm not saying go to the extreme, but just know that you're, you're always representing yourself, your family and your company. And I don't think that's something that is exclusive just to large organizations. Well, I love this list. I'm actually going to um, take it seriously to heart, especially as the CEO of my organization. But I'm wondering, it sounded to me like prior to that, um, you've had a pretty wonderful life. I'm looking at the picture behind you and I know that a snapshot of one room in your house and it's gorgeous. Um, you have had a really, you know, excuse my language, but kick-ass life. But was there ever a time where you had a bad mistake that you learned a lot from? I'm not talking about a previous marriage. I'm talking about just like, you know, <laughs> rock bottom, like, oh, and you, and you probably messed up, but that you were able to turn a corner from, I'm curious if, if you just kind of hit the jackpot and rode the wave. No, no, not at all. Um, I think the thing that has been a blessing in many ways has just been my, my work ethic. You know, I just work pretty hard and I love what I do, but there's, I think more than anything, Sonia, it's probably been the blind spots, you know, that, that later I see, you know, like when I first started, I just didn't think much about finance and I didn't think much about how to manage the business and the budget and so forth. That just sort of came much later. I had made all sorts of stupid mistakes. I'm sure, sure that I just, we were just dumb. We just didn't know. We, we didn't, I didn't have anybody in my family. I didn't know how to build a business. I didn't go to business school. Right. You know, right. I, learned, I knew how to coach. I was sort of smart in some ways. And I learned, I learned most of it by doing, I learned most Mm -hmm. of it through my clients, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think those blind spots, I don't know if there's anything that really stuck, uh, jumps out at me. I think it's the missed opportunities, you know, that Mm -hmm. I should have taken. Like somebody once wanted to have me write a book and they were going to help me write a book on life purpose work. Wow. Passed on it, you know? Wow. Um, We, we, 
we found another uh, manu, not a man, well, kind of a manuscript of of uh, somebody, and I thought this is really good stuff, and I actually started playing around with it. But then later, it became the movie The Secret. You know, I thought like, whoa, oh, we, we had that. We whoa. had, that, right? yeah, yeah, we yeah, had yeah. it in our hands, right? All you know. So it's yeah. like it's it's. I don't know whether I did anything really stupid. I mean, I've hired people that were. I mean, I've got, I did have somebody on my team for a while that I intuitively I knew was a wrong fit. And because I was scared to have that difficult conversation, I kept him on much too long. You sure. know, probably know yeah. the story because I've told yeah. you the story and yeah. it blew up. You know, the person made a huge, humongous mistake. We lost a very large uh, centerpiece client and it took about two and a half years to get him back, which we do yeah. now have him back, but it was yeah. very costly, very, very painful. The biggest mistake there was, you know, you have to handle the performance issues soon, I'm not saying you don't mentor, coach, support, give them flexibility. But at some point, if you got to let somebody go, you got to let them go. Otherwise, they're sure. going to hurt you and hurt your, hurt your company. And that I'm was a your big slap in the face. Yeah, you won't do that again. I, I can. Uh, no. <laughs> and I mean, I like that you um, I know I happen to know about you, Dean, that one of your um, you know, hallmark sentences or words is intuition. And I know how you're just saying right now, I had the intuition that I needed to let this person go, but I couldn't do it because the big conversation was just too hard. Yeah. But intuition is kind of one of your, I mean, tell tell people uh, about your podcast because it's called. Uh, it's called the business of intuition. It was Boom. based on a TED talk that I did about two years ago on the same topic. And um, I guess why is that something that's important to me? I think that we have uh, put a lot of emphasis around the conscious knowledge that is data focused, which in and of itself is just certainly fine and dandy, but we are not, uh, talk about diversity inclusion, we're not including the intuitive thought into conversations. I can't, if I'm not a subject matter expert, I can't participate. Um, mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. there's, there's so much other, uh, pattern recognition, so much other creative ideas that can come through this little thing called intuition that I really believe it's the, one of the most important human characteristics that cannot be replicated by AI. It's something mm -hmm. that, you know, when the, when the machines finally take over, the last thing they'll take is our, is our intuition, right? Mm -hmm. I think it is sure. so innately it. human and everybody knows it. This podcast, mm -hmm. I think I've now had 80 different interviews. Everybody knows what it is. Everybody yep. has an experience with it. Um, but I think it changes cultures when you allow for and you have the courage to speak uh, about things that you might be called intuitive. You may not call it to the team. Hey, I'm going to be intuitive here. Yeah. You might call it. I got a hunch. I got I'm barking up this tree. Tell me if I'm going up the wrong one. You might give people a way to hear what you have to say without it sounding too um, wishy-washy, if yeah. I will. But, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's um, uh, something that I also um, sincerely believe in. And I think we have some similar mentors around this as well. I mean, do you want to give a shout or name a couple of the people that have inspired you? Is there anyone that you um, just think the world of? Or if you could get them on your show, who would they be? Well, Joe Dispenza would be nice. Hey, Joe. Oh, how you hey, doing, Joe. Buddy? How's it going? Come on, bud. <laughs> I mean, when you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> He's just a tad busy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, no, I mean, those, these great thought great leaders, mentor. um, I think is, uh, I think there's wonderful to, to, obviously I, I, I listen to him. I listen to other people. Um, there's a lot of noise out there. Sure. There is, there's so many people who are coaches and are trying to be a part of this human development movement. And the, the challenge is, is to find your own voice in a way that doesn't sound like everybody else's because mm -hmm. we're inundated with so much choice of ways to have our attention taken. <laughs> so we yeah. got to stick out. And I think it goes back to your work in marketing and marketing and branding is, is being able to have that clear message. And I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to, you know, hone it in and get better at it. Yeah. But I think authentic, authenticity and coming from your heart and speaking from that space um, is one way you can cut through the noise. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. And so um, you had mentioned earlier, your, and I'm not going to keep you much longer, but your work ethic, mm -hmm. which is one of your strengths. And I do know that about you. And I was curious, what does that look like? Does that ever look like working 80 hours a week because you can't put it down? <laughs> or are you pretty good? I mean, what does your day look like? What are your work, work ethic and your daily rituals like to keep Dean sane and doing great work? Oh, well, um, 
for a while there, uh, because I think that the work ethic that I probably had for a while was based out of panic. Mm. You know, will this, will this thing survive? I got to support mm-hmm. my family, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it was that kind of that sort of a fear-based work ethic. I don't think that was very healthy. My wife finally said, we are taking two week, week vacations a year and that's just it. And so that was a really good thing. Um, after a while, I just, um, I realized that my life is not just about what I'd love to do, but the off time. And so one of the things I try to do every day is get up and take the dog for a walk, go to the gym, and then have a couple hours basically to myself before mm-hmm. I even start the day. That's been really helpful. Yeah. Um, no you know, emails, no activities. phones. You don't even no. look at it. You completely take your time. Well, I can't say I don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't act on them. I don't act on anything. I don't, or some, often at times I don't, but I, but it's like, I need a couple hours before I, I get up into my office and I start working, you know, mm-hmm. Great. that has been really, really helpful. And we're doing a lot more vacations and taking time away. And, um, you and know, do it's, you, do you put yeah. it down at the end of the day? Is there a dinner time? Like, you yeah, stop no, I put it down. I, I ask yeah. because I talk to a lot of my colleagues and other clients. And one of the biggest challenges, especially at a certain level, of course, CEO being one of them is, uh, you turning it off at the end of the day and not turning it on first thing in the morning and being able to have a, a, a realistic work week and still show up for your, for your clients. Do you feel, are you on, on a scale of one to 10? Where are you with that? Are you, you feel pretty solid about your. Le- um, I think I'm pretty good about that. You probably asked my family about that, but overall um, I think I'm probably the best that I've been good. in my life, you yeah. know, and um, it doesn't mean I just don't work hard, but, I'm not, I'm not frenetic. And I know that you even saw me at a frenetic time, like last year, hmm. there was something around that period of my life. I don't know what it was. And probably I was still in the, um, the wave of the COVID, um, yeah. panic of the yep. world. Right. Yep. And like, I didn't know whether we would survive, you know, I didn't know I, I was scared every time I was going to get on a phone call with one of my CEOs and go, could this be one that tells me that they're going to drop us. I mean, it was just that happened for several weeks and months and it was scarier than crap. And I thought, well, all right. So I've started making contingency plans and paying Mm -hmm. my mortgage down as fast as I could, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm just doing all sorts of stuff. So then it kind of created in me, which isn't, wasn't right, but it created a frenetic energy that I just had to, ah, you know, get stuff done. You're not alone. I mean, I think that's uh, probably true of 95% of people through last year. Um, myself included. I don't know that. I think I kind of uh, zoned out a little bit more, just kind of, well, whatever's going to be, uh, you know, will be, you know, yeah. my, uh, it's all good. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, but um, so how did you change that? How did, like, what shifted? Was it just that business shifted? COVID kind of seemed like it was alleviating or how did you change that? And I ask for personal reasons because I'm really trying to get to that point myself. That two hour morning would be amazing and I would love to do it. And I'd love to be able to put it down pretty comfortably at the end of the day. And I know uh, I've asked colleagues, I've asked clients at that level. um, And a lot of them would really like to know, how do you turn the tide of working, you know, 80 hours a week to having a pretty nice ritual rhythm work ethic, but without crazy. I think it's part of it is a um, a relaxation of trust in your people mm. and um, and not have to have them do the work the way you would do it. You know, my vision for my life right now is to give away the work to other people mm-hmm. and and see them have the fun that I've been having and and allow me to tr- do other things. You know, right. um, writing, for example. But it's. Um, it's kind of like it, you know, it kind of gets into this existential spiritual question is like, are you okay? Are you okay as a person? Are you, are you, do you have trust in yourself that you're going to make it? Yeah. You know, can you get through the week and the way and the, and the, are you all right? And I think that if you can um, include other people in your world and, and build bridges, you begin to realize that you're going through life as a community, not as an individual. Bingo. And Wonderful. you relax back into that. Like, and I think it's been challenging because we've got um, an increase of very passionate opinions going on right now in our little world that pits one person against another. And we've forgotten Mm -hmm. the the, Mm -hmm. the art of listening and of 
seeking to understand, going back to Stephen Covey, mm-hmm. uh, and somehow thinking that understanding means agreement, and it doesn't. It just means I understand you. And we don't seek to understand anymore. We seek to defend. We seek to ridicule. And it's that's the hardest part right now for me personally is, is seeing that and, and trying to mm-hmm. bring a conversation, whatever the conversation is, um, whether it's COVID, whether it's politics, whether it's something at a company, it's, can we get back to that? Yeah, hundred percent. Bingo. I can't, I can't think of a better place to um, actually end this now, Dean, because <laughs> you are an inspiration and um, I have a little outro here that I'm going to read. And for the people listening, I hope we just snip this piece out. <laughs> uh, but we've been talking to Dean Newland, who is the founder and CEO of Mission Facilitators and Dean, where can people learn more about you? Well, the normal places like LinkedIn, um, you can also find the uh, the podcast on our website. Our website is mfileadership.com. Um, social media, certainly, but, um, you know, Hunt we have a blog. Down. Hunt Sorry? him down. It's Dean Newland, N-E-W-L-U-N-D, for those looking to hunt him down. He, he can be found. All right, Dean. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on my podcast. This was a blast. And also thanks for your inspiration. You're very welcome. Anytime. Thanks for listening to It's Not Just Business Talks with Sonia, a real life podcast to inspire you. We'll see you again next time. And if this is your jam, click subscribe to get future episodes.